Upstart stock is the topic of today's presentation. And if you're somebody that's been holding upstart stock, let's say for the past year, then you've probably incurred some pretty heavy paper losses. Now, what you need to remember about Upstart is that it's a volatile tech stock. So when we first looked at their IPO, this was in December of 2020, we decided to pass on it for any number of reasons that we're going to discuss. Well, less than a year later, the price of that stock had increased nearly 800%. And we wrote about that in this piece, Why is Upstart's Stock Price Soaring? And the general takeaway there is that the intrinsic value of a firm doesn't rise 800% in less than a year. So there was certainly hype that was involved with that. And when you look at what the share price has done since, it's fallen about 95%. So instead of using share prices, sometimes it's easier to use valuation. So if we take market cap of the firm and divide it by annualized revenues, we call this simple valuation ratio. At the time of their IPO, that was 50. The last time we looked, that was in September of 2021, it was 27. And today, it's two. So you can see here the First value is market cap, the second value is annualized revenue. So they had very strong revenue growth, followed by a steep decline. Now this coming quarter, they're expecting $100 million. You can see their revenues on the right-hand side and how much those are sliding. And the question here is, is there value to be had buying this fallen high flyer? Now, when we talk about AI loan issuance, they use 1,500 factors to determine credit worthiness. And you need to be careful when you start reading some of the language here that implies they have a mission other than um, increasing shareholder values. They talk here, traditional banks underserve certain demographics. Well, there's a reason for that, right? And sometimes these reasons are uncomfortable to talk about. But the fact of the matter is that um, everybody is not equal when it comes to their ability to repay loans, and we can't exert perfect fairness across all the different ways that we want to slice and dice disadvantaged groups in the United States. So there are certainly trends leading towards the value that AI provides, that traditional banking isn't sufficient. Sure, you have freelancer work, you have fintech companies where um, people might bank with a fintech and you don't have any sort of credit history. There's gig work where you have uncertain income streams. But uh, one good way to evaluate somebody's ability to repay a loan is simply to look at how they spend their money. So you may have recalled uh, in the past there were quite a few fintechs that wanted you to, let's say for a certain benefit, uh, open up your bank account so they could see all your transactions. And that would allow them to assess you as a customer much more accurately. Now, what Upstart does is they're involved in the least desirable lending product, which is unsecured loans. 96% of the loans that they issued last quarter uh, were unsecured loans compared to 4% in auto, which they were said to be diversifying into. Just remember that people are always going to take enough rope to hang themselves. And what we're most concerned about when we look at business models like this is that the only way you can sustain growth of unsecured loans is by increasingly becoming laxer in your lending requirements. So when you think about the goals of Upstart, you know, they say here, they, unless you're in the few percent of Americans with significant wealth, the price of borrowing affects you every day. Well, yeah, that's reality. When you borrow money, then you should try to never borrow money, especially unsecured loans. What are you using those for exactly? If you're a responsible spender, then an unsecured loan shouldn't be uh, something that's on your radar. They talk here about how consumers on their platform benefit from higher approval rates and lower interest rates. Well, these are two... Um, conflicting variables. So a higher approval rate when you're approving more people, assumably you're taking on more risk and you would want to see higher interest rates on the tail end of that. So when you have both these factors, they say higher approval rates, they say 43% more borrow, borrowers are approved and yields are 43% lower on the average APR. That's not very appealing if I'm somebody that's purchasing those loan packages. It just isn't. It's appealing to the, to the customer, not to me as an investor. Now, they say the benefits to investors would be access to new customers. That's not necessarily a good thing. Lower fraud, okay, fair enough. That should be um, 
minimal anyway, and loss rates. Well, that's key there, defaults and the ability of these people to pay back the money that they borrow and increased automation. So somewhere around 80% of their loans now are fully automated. That may be a good or a bad thing in terms of the automation decreases your need to hire people to do the same thing, but also is that automation approving loans that it shouldn't. So they say here that for the loans purchased by institutional investors, so we're going to talk about who purchases the the loans and who originates them, but Upstart uh, brings in those leads. And all vintages, good word, from 2018 through 2020 are forecasted to deliver returns that would meet or exceed what institutional investors were expecting. However, this next point is notable. Our 2021 through mid-2022 vintages have underperformed relative to target returns. Well, your investors aren't going to come back for more if you're underperforming what you said you were going to do. And one key problem we see for this firm is the same sort of regulatory risks we pointed out for Metro Mile. And here you can see this fair lending monitorship of upstart networks lending model. And it's this uh, quote unquote independent monitor that's analyzing how they're lending and whether or not that's quote unquote fair. Um, my interpretation of this would be uh, nothing short of a shakedown. So the government uh, inquired as to whether or not uh, Upstart was uh, fairly lending to individuals and they agreed to, which they shouldn't have, what's more or less a shakedown by ad- adv- advocacy groups um, who are going to. Uh, Uh, make sure that there are audits by a civil rights law firm on Upstart's lending practices. And you can read that report that we mentioned in the previous slide for yourselves, and it's full of what you would expect. Statements like, we also observe that the average APR rates for disadvantaged group X would also improve to some extent under these alternatives they're proposing, and that both alternatives would lead to increased approval rates for disadvantaged group X. Could care less the APR rates and approval rates for this disadvantaged group. We care about the quality of the loans that are being issued and the likelihood of those individuals paying that money back based on the APR of the funds that we're lending them. So this has absolutely nothing to do with the way that this entity wants to slice and dice the population and start pretending that they care about certain disadvantaged groups. And this other bit here, they caution on a variable whose predictive value in a model is attributable solely or largely to its correlation with a protected characteristic. That becomes very touchy. So because you can slice and dice a population, according to these individuals, in about a thousand different chunks, you'll always be able to point to a chunk that has a correlation to one of the 1,500 variables that you're using. For example, they point out this problem, Upstart's model has a high likelihood of being able to predict whether a borrower is age 62 or older. And then they go on to talk about the the delicacies around... um, or the delicate points around um, age and lending. So clearly, as somebody gets older, you have more information, more history, you can make more accurate assessments. So you would favor lending money to older people with more of a track record. That's a given. But no, then you're discriminating based on age. You see how these individuals will always create problems for themselves to quote unquote solve. And what you conclude when you read a report like this is that the real arbitrage opportunity is created when you bypass all this bullshit, these limitations imposed by these quote unquote doers of good. So when we revisit the risks that um, we presented in September of 2021 for this firm, we said there was too much reliance on the American consumer. There was a a problem with the demand for purchasing these unsecured loans drying up quicker than secured loans. The more risky loans are the first uh, type to go when these lending institutions start to tighten their purse strings. We talked about the potential regulatory risks coming from discriminatory lending, and we talked about specifically how those risks can affect upstart and pretty much devastate their business model. Customer concentration risk, the individuals that are purchasing those loans and the lead provider concentration risk. So uh, these were all things that we pointed out. Here on the right, you can see how the RONA impacted upstart's quarterly revenue growth. And we said that uh, if there was another recession that they would face a similar problem. Indeed, they are. Um, 
concentration risk. So here's a major problem that we pointed out before, and it continues to exist. So in the year, or say last year, this firm, Cross River Bank, or CRB, originated over half their loans, and fees received from that firm accounted for 45% of Upwork's revenues. That's uh, revenue concentration risk. And when you tack on another close to 30% from another partner of theirs, you know, you're somewhere around the range of 80% of revenues coming from uh, two individuals. So more or less 73% of revenues come from these two partners. And you see here on the right, this recent Bloomberg article just from last month talking about how the Cross River Bank gets FDIC enforcement order over lending, unsafe or unsound practices related to fair lending laws. Boy, they're going to start feeling the pressure from all sides now. The end result would be declining revenues that you can see here. This is over the last eight quarters. You can see how that trajectory just tailed off. And as we said, the bigger picture is what happens to Upwork when there's a recession or black swan event. Here we can see what happens to Upstart. And I think that this individual over at The Fool uh, had a pretty good take on what's going on here. And they said that secondary investors, so the people that buy loans from Upstart, are concerned about how credit quality on upstart loans will hold up. Exactly. Especially when you start to see external pressures dictate how they ought to be changing their algorithms to make sure everybody's treated fairly. And what the end result is, a huge decline in the number of loans upstart can originate because there's nowhere for those loans to go. We're going to talk about that in a second. And this individual's view is that Upstart would have had a more resilient business model if they could get more banks and credit unions to fund and retain loans. Now, what's the likelihood of that happening in today's environment? Very low. Now, when you look at issuing loans from Upstart, where those are going. So in 2022, 30% of the loans funded on their platform were retained by the originating lending partners, those two firms that are responsible for 73% of revenues, one which is facing some problems, which is a concern. Then 60% of the remaining loans were purchased by institutional investors through their loan funding programs, okay? And then 10% were funded on their balance sheet. That's a concern. Watch that metric closely. So they say here that... Uh, in the past, the percentage of loans funded through their balance sheet has generally decreased, the loan risk they're taking on themselves, while the percentage purchased by institutional investors has increased. It's going in the opposite direction. So they say, in 2022, we have increased the percentages, percentage of loans retained by Upstart. Well, at IPO time, they didn't even that wasn't even a focus for them. So 78% of loans were sold to institutional investors. 22% were held by the banks. What you're seeing here is the... Um, origination of loans starting to dry up because there's nowhere for those to go. And here you can see that quarterly trend. You can see cash for Upstart going down there at the top. The next line item, their loans, notes, and residuals. You can see that increasing. Yeah, sure. Some of that is for R&D for their uh, auto loan program, which is a very, having a very minimal impact. But when you get down there to transaction volume dollars, you can see that just falling off a cliff. Sure, they're fully automated, but... Um, the fact that they can't uh, do anything with the loans that are originating is a problem. When they start sticking more and more in their balance sheet, well, where's the money for that coming from? So when we look at lending by product, again, big concern here. Just 4% of their exposure is uh, to auto loans, and they had made that acquisition to try and diversify away from uh, personal unsecured loans, which is about as risky as it gets, and they haven't managed to do that. So just to conclude, this firm is facing numerous headwinds, preventing them from realizing the sort of growth that we had seen before. Uh, we believe betting on unsecured personal loans in a recession is a very bad idea and that this loan performance will continue to degrade over time. And there's a vicious cycle there because then the institutions purchasing these loans, especially if they're underperforming, as we mentioned, won't want to purchase anymore. This is a thesis we cannot get excited about. I'll just say one other thing. If you use AI to make credit decisions, you better bury those L goes deep within your organization so you don't have to go through these um, audits from these civil rights firms that want to dictate how you ought to run your business based on completely arbitrary ways of slicing and dicing a population. So I put up another video here that you might be interested. Before you click that, please click the logo on the right, subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.